Hello and welcome to this Electrical Principles training video. In this video we're going to continue considering the subject of AC theory and we're going to start exploring the subject of power in an AC circuit. So in this first video we're just going to have a look at what happens to power in a purely resistive circuit and then we're going to see what happens as our circuit becomes more and more capacitive and more and more inductive. So as you can see on the screen here, we've got two sine waves. So we're gonna say that the red sine wave represents our voltage and the blue sine wave represents our current. So you can see here, this is a purely resistive circuit because the voltage and current are in phase with each other. Again, if you're not sure what I'm talking about here by them being in phase, then please watch a previous video in this series. So we're going to say that our voltage waveform has a value of five volts and our current waveform has a value of two amps. Now we're using the peak values here. Uh, we could use the RMS value and purists would argue that we should be using the RMS values, uh, but that's gonna cause a little bit more confusion in this video than we need. So the peak values will function perfectly fine for what we need to do here. So hopefully from a previous video, we're quite comfortable with the idea that if we've got a purely resistive circuit, the voltage and the current will be in phase with each other. If however, we start to make our circuit more and more inductive, we'll remember that the current will start to lag the voltage by a maximum of 90 degrees when the circuit becomes purely inductive. So that's a circuit that has no resistance, just inductance. And we also are familiar with the idea that if we make our circuit increasingly capacitive until it gets to the point where it is purely capacitive, that is a circuit that has no resistance and no inductance, just purely capacitance, we can see that the current will lead the voltage by 90 degrees. So far, so good. Now let's have a chat about how power is affected in our circuit. Again, from a previous video on Joe Robinson training, we'll know that the basic way that we calculate power in either a DC circuit or in an AC circuit that is purely resistive is to take the current and multiply it by the voltage. Now we could do that at every single point along this waveform. So if we were to do that, if we were to take the current here and multiply it by the voltage here, we know that we'd come out with a value of zero watts. So the current times the voltage here where they're both zero would give us zero watts. But as we move along our waveform, we can see that actually the voltage times by the current will get bigger and bigger and bigger and then drop off again until we get to this point here. So we can see that we multiply the voltage by the current at various points along this waveform. And when we get to this point here where we've got maximum voltage and maximum current, we've got the maximum power represented as our waveform. So two amps times five volts gives us 10 watts. Now, what does your intuition tell you at this point is going to happen with our power waveform? You may look at this and think, well, surely it will just follow the same line as the voltage in the current and it will drop below the X axis. Well, remember in an AC circuit, when the voltage or the current goes below this X axis, what that indicates is not a lack or a debt of electricity, although it's in a minus region of the graph, all it indicates is that the current has changed its direction and is now going the opposite way around the circuit. However, if our power waveform drops below the X axis and comes down here, that takes on a completely different meaning for a power waveform because what that would indicate is that actually we do have kind of a lack of power. What it would actually indicate is that we are putting power back into the system again. So instead of the system dissipating power, we would actually be putting power back into the system. Now you can kind of see that for a resistive load like say a lamp or something like that, that would be completely ludicrous because it, we would have to have some kind of opposite to light and heat coming away from the lamp. We would have to be supplying light and heat to the lamp in order to put power back into the system. So logically, that tells us that the power line cannot drop below the x-axis, but actually mathematically, this is supported for us also, which is really nice because if we look at this logically, here we've got a negative voltage and a negative current here and here. And if we multiply two negative values together, what happens? Well, of course, the output is positive. So you can see here that when we get to the end of one full cycle of our AC waveform, you can see that the power waveform represented by this green line 
has not actually at any point dropped below the horizontal x-axis. So logically that makes sense and mathematically that makes sense which is quite beautiful and actually if we just extend this all the way along here you can see that actually the power is always positive. So where we've got a purely resistive circuit the power is always positive. The circuit is always dissipating power mostly in the form of heat and sometimes in the form of light as well. Now let's consider what happens when we make the circuit purely capacitive. So let's take our waveform and move it across here. So now this arrangement, as you'll remember from a previous video, indicates that we have a purely capacitive circuit. The current is leading the voltage by 90 degrees in this circuit. So let's start to think about what's going to happen with our power. If we look at this, we can see here we've got 0 times plus 2. So that means that our power waveform is going to start off at 0, just as it was before. And at every point along this first part of the waveform, you can see that we've always got a positive number times by a positive number. So we end up with a positive waveform. And when we get to this position on the graph, you can see that the waveform has remained in the positive part of the graph. So that indicates that power is being dissipated at that point. However, when we go past that point, we can now see that the power has gone negative for this part of the cycle. And that is because from here onwards, we've got a positive value multiplied by a negative value. And when you multiply positive by a negative, you get a negative value. So this may seem to contradict everything that I've just said in the opening part of this video. And that might seem a little bit confusing at first, but actually what's happening here is we said that in a purely resistive circuit, if the power line went below the horizontal x-axis, we would have to be putting power back into the system. Well, actually, that's exactly what's happening inside our capacitor. During this part of the cycle, the capacitor is charging up, so it's using power effectively. But then, during this part of the cycle, the energy that was stored in our capacitor in the form of that electric charge kind of gets put back into the system again. So the electrons will move out of the capacitor and back into the circuit, indicating that it is now putting that stored energy back into the circuit again. And so we end up with a negative power graph here. Then what happens is as we continue with the cycle, you can see that the uh, graph goes positive again. So power is being used, but then the power gets put back into the system again power is being used, power gets put back into the system again. And in reality, that just keeps on going and going and going. So you can see there now, if I uh, just switch off these two waveforms for the moment, you can see we end up with a graph for the power that goes positive and negative. And if you average out all of the points along this line, you can see that actually what's happening is that a purely capacitive circuit is not dissipating any power. So I'm sure you'll agree that's quite an interesting insight into the way that power behaves in a purely capacitive circuit. Now let's think about what happens if the uh, circuit that we're dealing with is not purely capacitive but goes to the opposite extreme and becomes purely inductive. Now this is a much less realistic situation because as we know an inductor is a coil. That coil will have a value of resistance due to the nature of how it's been made. It's made up of a coil of wire which will have a little bit of resistance. And so it's very, very difficult to get a purely inductive load. There have been instances where we've managed to cool down uh, conductors, certain alloys down to absolute zero, and effectively they lose all of their resistance at that point, but that's not something that we can use practically in the real world for our machines. In reality, our inductive loads will always have a little bit of resistance. But the principle holds true. If we could get hold of a purely inductive circuit, how would the power behave now? Well, there's a bit of a spoiler on this one because as we start to show our power graph on here, you can see that instantly it starts off in this negative area. Now, bearing in mind that we've just kind of come in at a random position on this waveform, uh, it's not putting power back into the system that it doesn't already have. Obviously, it would always have to have a little bit of uh, power, a little bit of energy stored in the coil uh, to begin with. But you can see we've got a negative value multiplied by a positive value, which gives us a negative outcome. And you can see here that the uh, power graph is in the negative part of the cycle. And then as we reveal some more of our graph, you can see we get to this point, And you can see that at this point, uh, 
the power has now become positive. So the inductor is effectively storing a little bit of energy again in the form of the magnetic field that is generated around the coil. And then when the current dies away or the uh, voltage and the current uh, follow the next part of the relationship, as you can see here, the voltage goes negative and the current is currently positive. You can see that the energy that is stored inside that magnetic field, when it collapses, it kind of creates electricity back inside the coil and it goes back into the system again. So the coil charges up with energy and then discharges the energy back into the circuit. So you may notice I'm kind of using power and energy interchangeably in this uh, presentation. Uh, again, we really should just be purely referring to power at this point because uh, energy includes a time factor, but the principle remains the same. So you can see here that as we move along our waveform, you can see there that we end up with this lovely pattern forming. And let's just shut down those two. And you can see that actually we've got a very similar looking waveform to the waveform that we had for a purely capacitive circuit. It's just shifted along the x-axis there. And you can see that again, if we average out all the points along this power waveform, that the average of that would actually be zero. Therefore, a purely inductive load would not dissipate any power because it's constantly charging up the magnetic field and then discharging back into the circuit again. So that's how power behaves in a purely resistive circuit, in a purely capacitive circuit, and in a purely inductive circuit. We've seen that in a purely capacitive and a purely inductive circuit, the components that make up that circuit do not discharge any power. They do not dissipate any power. They are effectively power neutral. All that remains in this video is to say, thank you very much for watching.